Okay, so last time we introduced for real algebra G, I introduced the envelope algebra UG, and I it has a filtration, increasing filtration, UP of G, I call it. Zero less than p, less than infinity, <coughs> and where u zero g is field C. I am taking real algebra O C. I mean, much of what I am saying will go through for over any field, but let's confine ourselves to C. <coughs> u not g equals C and we do not u p g by u p minus 1 g, uh, u p g is contain u p plus 1 g and one can form the so called associated graded algebra which not u g is some equal to 0 to infinity upg by up minus 1 g it being understood that u minus 1 of g is 0. Then last time I proved that the, the theorem which is proved as following the natural map G to U one G to E not this is, this is denoted E not P G <coughs> E not one G is injective is an isomorphism. which extends to an algebra isomorphism of S <coughs> of the symmetric algebra of G on E not U G. This is a symmetric algebra. So, in particular, this is commutative. As is well known, this is isomorphic to polynomial algebra. O C in dimension G number of variables. <coughs> this theorem is usually called the Poincare Birkhoff theorem. I do not think any of them formulated the theorem in this fashion, <coughs> neither Poincare nor Birkhoff nor Witt. And in fact, uh, Eilenberg used to say that uh, Birkhoff had nothing to do with it. I do not, he says, it should be called Poincare Witt theorem, where, where, what is Birkhoff doing there is, is a comment which he made, which may not be entirely fair to Birkhoff because, you know, Birkhoff was uh, anti Semitic and uh, Eilenberg is very much a Jew. So, he might have some prejudice against uh, Birkhoff for that reason. <coughs> I mean, he disliked Birkhoff probably rightly, but to say that he did not prove the theorem, had nothing to do with the theorem, I think is wrong. Anyway, okay, so that is the theorem. <coughs> and 
yeah one consequence of the theorem yeah now let me take the case when g is semi simple in fact g is well uh, using notation g is the complexification of a compact group is what we know of a of the real algebra of a compact group maybe i'll write gc itself compact g <coughs> now in this case we know that if t is a maximal torus in g and the lie algebra it's of t then we could decompose gc as t plus sigma tc to sigma j alpha alpha and delta and now one can further decompose these things in the following fashion uh, <coughs> this equals tc let me write this way first direct sum g alpha alpha and delta minus plus tc plus direct sum g alpha minus alpha Yes, so minus alpha and delta plus, and alpha. here it is alpha and delta plus. <coughs> you can write it like this. These two are Lie subalgebras. All, all three of them are Lie subalgebras because we know that g alpha g beta is contained in g alpha plus beta, which could be zero if alpha plus beta is not a root. This is zero. Anyway, I have this decomposition, and this is a subalgebra. Both these are subalgebras. I denote this by n plus n n minus, and this by n plus. <coughs> There are complex Lie subalgebras. This is also Lie subalgebra, of course. <coughs> and then one consequence of the Poincare-Birkhoff theorem. Rather, is this U G equals U n minus times U of T C times U n plus. <coughs> Now you arrange the bases such that the the e alphas follow the order in the roots, and here you pick up again. Here also there is a H alpha, the H H H H I H H alpha. Also, there is an order. You can simply take the simple roots here that form a basis, and you have a basis here. From and from the Poincare-Birkhoff theorem, it's clear that this is going to be true. By this, I mean you take an element A, element B, and element C here. A B forms the product A B C, and take all possible linear combinations such elements. <coughs> okay, so the corollary is one minus U G C. Now we also saw that. There is a bijective correspondence between representations of G on any vector space, not necessarily finite dimensional. Between representations of G on any vector space and U G modules, U G is a ring, and I look at U G modules, the bijective correspondence. Whenever you have a homomorphism between two representations, you have a corresponding homomorphism U G modules. Okay, <coughs> so 
I will freely talk of UG modules instead of representations. The two things are the same. Now, <coughs> suppose if rho is a finite dimensional representation of <coughs> G that is a finite dimensional UG finite dimensional over K over C UG module. Suppose rho is then we know that rho rho H C rho T C all of rho T C is diagonalizable or what is the same that is V rho the representation space breaks up into so direct sum of Eigen spaces for T C. We also know and the Eigen spaces the Eigen characters on T or which is the same thing as linear forms on T C with <coughs> satisfying some condition because they have to linear forms which <coughs> must integrate to a character on T that gives you Anyway, linear forms on TC, the Eigen characters <coughs> are called weights. Now, we know the weights take real values on H, which by definition. IT and we had a and in fact for every root alpha <coughs> 2 lambda and weight lambda we have 2 lambda alpha by alpha alpha is an integer. We have seen that by looking at the representation of two dim of the three dimensional linear algebra given by g alpha g minus alpha and h alpha. <coughs> so if we prove this, we already proved this statement. Okay. <coughs> now so in particular the lambda takes real values. So one can talk of the, the we have a to, total order. We have introduced a lexicographic order on H, on on the dual of H. Have total lexicographic order on. <coughs> let me use small lambda. on H star omega char <coughs> in which rho has a highest weight. The total order there are only finitely many of them. So you find that there is the highest weight which I will call lambda capital lambda rho. 
that will be the highest weight. Now let V lambda rho V rho or V V lambda rho be a be an eigenvector for T <coughs> corresponding to lambda rho corresponding to the side <coughs> lambda rho. Now let us look at the we have this space V rho and it is a modulo u g so it makes sense to talk of consider the map x going to x v rho rho x. <coughs> I use rho also to look at the way the u g operates on that. So this is the mapping of of u g in v rho. We have a ring and a module in vector, uh, an element in the module m, then there is the mapping A going to A m. <coughs> okay. Now this is a notice that u g is a module over itself by left multiplication, any ring is a module over itself. So this and this mapping is easily seen to be a g module homomorphism, a u g module homomorphism. This is a G module homomorphism. All that you have to check is so if you put y x there you are going to it is going to rho y rho x v rho that is the kind of thing you check. <coughs> okay. Now the upshot of this is the following. So you find that v rho uh, if, if rho is irreducible this mapping is a UG module homomorphism so the image and the mapping is not 0 because the element 1 in UG keeps 0 in itself so it is a non-zero map if rho is irreducible then this map let me call this map uh, this map I will call pi rho from u g to v rho. If rho is reducible pi rho is on to because the image is a g module and I am assuming rho is irreducible so it has no proper g modules. So you find that if rho is reducible pi rho is on to. So you know that this implies v rho is isomorphic to u g modulo an ideal <coughs> a left ideal which where should I write yeah yeah I am treating as a modulo I rho a left ideal maximal left ideal because it is irreducible so the image is on to <coughs> and the map the u g modulo i rho is isomorphic to v rho <coughs> and i rho has to be a maximal ideal because if it is not maximal there will be bigger module which will v rho will not be irreducible. So <coughs> and what is happening here you look at u g of v rho which is the image in v rho is same thing as u n minus times <coughs> u t c u n plus on v. Notice that <coughs> first thing I will note that E alpha V 
zero for every alpha in V rho for every alpha in delta plus. The reason is this is because E alpha V rho is an Eigen vector of T C with Eigen character lambda plus alpha which is greater than lambda because alpha is positive lambda plus alpha is greater than 0 and I am assuming that lambda is the highest weight lambda rho. V rho is the weight vector corresponding to the Eigen character lambda rho if I apply E alpha V rho if I apply element H here H E alpha V rho will become H E alpha <coughs> minus so, so if h is in h h e alpha v rho is by definition e alpha h v rho plus <coughs> bracket h e alpha alpha h e alpha bracket h e alpha times v rho. So you find H e alpha V rho, H V rho we know is this is E alpha lambda rho H V rho plus alpha H E alpha V rho plus this and that the two add up to lambda rho plus alpha H so it is this vector will correspond to something of higher weight which is not possible because lambda is highest which means it has to be 0. So you find that note that this is true and so what happens when I apply u and plus on v rho this stays in this entire thing all the alphas keep it fixed whenever alpha is positive root and every element of the enveloping algebra of n plus can be written as a product of E alphas and some scalar all the all of the product of the product of each E alpha will annihilate V rho. So any products of E alphas will annihilate V rho and then some scalar can come there so it completely contains C V rho. In fact you can include this also and still it will be in this whole thing is in C rho because after all it is an Eigen vector for it. So you find that the vector space V rho so you find that U G V rho is same thing as U n minus V rho. But this means, <coughs> which is what of zero? Zero is made up of summation zero lambda minus some sigma m. Uh, let me write m i m alpha alpha with alpha in the simple roots. We know every root is a sum of simple roots. So you find that V rho becomes star is a sum of these things as this varies alpha and pi m alpha greater than equal to 0. So not only is it true that all the weights are smaller but they are of a specific type they are always of the form lambda rho minus sigma m alpha alpha every weight is of the form alpha is simple root m alpha and notice that moreover the weight space
corresponding to lambda rho is of dimension 1 because you start with vector space we apply keep applying this this always stays in that one dimensional space up to this everything stays in that one dimensional space once I apply some element of u and minus the one dimensional space is moved into something which is corresponds to an eigen uh, uh, weight vector of smaller distinctly smaller one. So because of that you never come back to 0. So and that whole thing is stable under the another thing algebra and therefore it is irreducible. So that proves that the highest weight vector is of dimension 1. So these are facts which we we'll keep we we'll keep note of <coughs> okay now what we would like to do, what we want to do is to classify all irreducible representations Next statement I want to make is the following, two la for every root alpha greater than 0, 2 lambda rho alpha by alpha alpha is greater than or equal to 0. This is the third fact. Why is this? This again, if you have a representation of SL2, we saw that the if you apply E alpha, E minus alpha and take that SL2 and up keep applying E alpha on one side, E minus alpha on one side, the number of times is the so we saw sir, last time if using representation of C. C e minus alpha, we saw that we see that 2 lambda rho 2 for any <coughs> weight vector mu of v rho 2 mu alpha by alpha alpha equals <coughs> p minus q where p is the largest integer with <coughs> mu plus P minus one alpha not a weight and Q we see largest integer such that mu minus Q minus one alpha is not a weight. That is I st there, there is this weight mu if I keep applying E alpha I get getting new weights mu plus alpha mu plus 2 alpha and so on and similarly at the back here you get mu minus alpha <coughs> that is I am looking at the entire set of weights of the form mu plus n alpha with n and z and if you look at from the picture in the two dimensional representation you find that p minus q equals this you go a certain number of steps on the right keep increasing a certain number of steps the terminates at some point both on the right side and left side and then if you look at what happens for irreducible representation of vessel 2 you find that p minus q this this can be thought of as 2 mu h alpha by h alpha h alpha. 
So, it is purely SL2 representation statement. Okay, that is an important statement. This has to be why is why is 2 lambda rho of alpha greater than 0? The point is you get oh sorry, it should be the other way around p is largest integer with yeah mu plus p you know it should be q minus p. I got it wrong, it should be q minus p. Why? Because what this is I mean it is easy to check. So, p is the largest integer with mu plus p minus alpha not root right, it should be q minus p. Now, in the case if 2 lambda rho is, if lambda rho is the highest weight, lambda rho plus alpha is not a root. That means, <coughs> this becomes uh, p yeah p, p, bec p becomes which way is it? I think p is the largest integer with mu plus p minus 1 alpha is, uh, sorry it should be mu plus oh mu plus p minus 1 alpha is a weight. Similarly, is a weight. Mu plus p minus alpha. Well, this is the correct statement. Once you have the statement, you find that p becomes zero, and q is some some positive integer. So, two mu alpha by alpha, alpha for lambda rho, p is zero because plus alpha is not a root. It is the largest integer with p minus 1 alpha is the root. So, if I add one more, it is not going to be root anymore, p is largest integer. <coughs> so, the thing is this so for any, so we have the following three properties for the highest weight if rho is in irreducible. Finite dimensional representation <coughs> of G and lambda rho is highest weight then two lambda rho alpha by alpha alpha is greater than or equal to 0 for every alpha in delta plus. That is equal to saying 2 lambda rho alpha alpha is greater than or equal to 0 for every alpha in pi. clear because pi is contained delta plus one on the one hand and every element of delta plus can be written as a positive linear combination non negative linear combination of elements of pi. Just alpha will be sigma m i alpha i where alpha are simple roots. So, <coughs> there is one other thing which I should have stated yeah the other point is that if alpha beta are simple roots then 2 alpha beta by alpha alpha is less than or equal to 0 which also means why because now alpha minus beta is not a root. So, your q becomes 0 and, and p <coughs> Uh, mu plus sorry this fact you have already done before have done this before okay 2 alpha beta by alpha alpha in fact 
in proving that everything is a non negative integral linear combination I use this fact already anyway these are <coughs> okay. So if you is a what one, one is going to say is the following this is a converse it says that if lambda is a linear form satisfying this condition lambda alpha by alpha alpha with 0 then there is a unique irreducible representation with lambda as highest weight. So that is the theorem we are after theorem given any lambda in its star such that 2 lambda alpha by alpha alpha is an integer <coughs> and this set of all non negative integers for every alpha in phi there is an irreducible representation finite dimensional representation such that this a unique up to equal isomorphism irreducible finite dimensional representation which I call rho lambda with lambda rho as its highest Sorry? Capital N stands for greater than equal to 0. Is including 0 in my notation. Yeah. I think there is some notation that it is like, uh, 1 onwards. Yeah, that is the usual thing, yes. but I prefer to use this because this looks more clumsy. I do not use that. <laughs> putting, putting a greater than equal to 0 on top. <coughs> so, I, I usually consistently use this for non negative integers. See, n they usually say is natural numbers to exclude 0 is absurd, 0 is as natural a number as any other natural number. <laughs> anyway, so this is the theorem. Well, for this, I want to develop a theory which will not necessarily which will include modules which do which do not which have highest weight but are not necessarily do not necessarily satisfy that integrality condition and, and the positive state condition those two conditions. So for this reason one introduces what are called so Verma modules. Dn Verma is one of the few mathematicians of an object named after them in mathematics. <coughs> well, sorry. Dn Verma is one of the few mathematicians from India. Yeah, yeah, for Indian mathematicians. I didn't say Indian. Okay, that's what I meant. Indian mathematicians who have an object named after. Him. <coughs> quite an important one. Sir, sure. yeah, yeah. Quite it's quite an important practice. In fact, uh, he he proved some interesting results about uh, this these modules in his thesis, and that is where the I think it is uh, who called it. Dixmier. Huh? Dixmier. Dixmier called them Verma modules, though they have been dealt with by other people. Harishandra himself has dealt with Verma modules before, but there are too many things named after Harishandra perhaps, so you cannot have one more. <coughs> okay, what are Verma modules? You look at UG and let lambda be a element in 
in fact one can take an element in home TCC itself and take that and then look at the ideal that I lambda I think I lambda I've used for something else so let maybe as use script I lambda be the <coughs> ideal generated by n plus and h minus lambda h as h varies in h yeah t c or h it makes no difference I take the ideal generated by this and let me denote by I have been using v for something else so I cannot use it for this so let me denote by m lambda the module u g by I lambda this by definition is the Verma module corresponding to now let us look at the let me do not let V lambda be the image. of 1 in I <coughs> in M lambda of this mapping U G C so V lambda goes into that. <coughs> what happens here is this so you have a mapping of this into this and if you like by definition this is an exact sequence of U G modules. Now the point is claim uh, V lambda yeah then first of all then V lambda is annihilated by n plus and we also have <coughs> H V lambda lambda H that is exactly how this is defined h minus lambda h annihilates to the vector because in the ideal therefore h v is lambda h v lambda <coughs> and therefore it follows that which is often used. Sir? there is a tensor product notation which is often used for the Verma module what the tensor product it is u g over oh yeah yeah G sure sure uh, no well yeah and a one dimensional vector space u b b is the sum of b c and n plus and notice that our vector <coughs> v lambda is an eigen vector for the entire this sub algebra which I called h c plus n plus this is usually called b sorry t c plus n it is usually called b. B for Borel. B, the, the vector V is an eigen vector for B, and therefore you look at UG tensor. After all, <coughs> see, the, the, you can think of this uh, well, if you look at UG tensor U, UB, the CB is a left module, and uh, U G is the right U B module. You can form the tensor product. This are non, it's a non non-complete situation. So you can write it right one and left one and form the tensor product. And on that U G still acts on the left. That's how you get the module. This 
this is a C is a left module under UB, UG is also is a right module under UB, the tensor product is a a priori is it's only a vector space nothing more, but there is left action of UG on this which will survive which will give you an action on this. So, you can identify this m lambda with this. Anyway, V lambda is annihilated by n plus and you also have H V lambda for every H in T C, H in H it is equivalent completely. All right. Now, the point is and look so once again you exactly as before you find that the module m lambda therefore equals u n minus v lambda. The module m lambda is this and v lambda is an eigenvector for n plus sorry for T c. So, if you apply claim is m lambda is spanned by eigenspaces for <coughs> T c the corresponding weights are of the form yeah are of the form lambda minus sigma m alpha alpha <coughs> I can write alpha and delta plus or alpha and phi makes no difference m alpha greater than equal to 0 because when you take this vector v lambda you want to apply e on minus which means successively applying e minus alpha 1 e minus alpha 2 etc. Each time you apply e minus alpha v lambda you end up in a weight eigen vector for t and the corresponding eigen is lambda minus alpha and arguing exactly as before we also see that further. So, these are eigen spaces so I will call, I'll call them weight spaces even though it is no, we are no longer the finite dimensional situation. It so happens it is an infinite dimensional vector space, but nevertheless it the, there are Eigen vectors and it is spanned by Eigen vectors for the algebra H. <coughs> so, further the <coughs> yeah, so M lambda is spanned by Eigen vectors. for T c and the Eigen space corresponding to lambda is one dimensional. Now, from this it is going to be easy to deduce the following theorem m lambda admits a unique maximal ug sub module unique proper maximal which is a module let us call that m prime lambda. Then m lambda by m prime lambda obviously will become an irreducible ug module. It is unique irreducible quotient of m lambda. 
So what you have is a situation that for every lambda you are able to get hold of a needle-to-field representation m lambda. And what is more, m also m lambda is isomorphic to m mu if and only if, if and only if lambda equal to mu. Oh, sorry, m lambda by let's we call this uh, give this a name. M lambda by so module is if let me call this let me call this V lambda. V lambda is you know you can do the cross huh? M lambda prime is not so clear. M prime lambda. Yeah, no, but the definition. I'm going to prove this statement. I have said the theorem quotient of uh, Unique to the of m lambda and v lambda is isomorphic to v lambda prime or v mu if and only if lambda equal to this is a statement. <coughs> the uniqueness is clear. See, I know that uh, if we Suppose V lambda and V mu are isomorphic, which means what? V lambda is the unique quotient of this M lambda and V mu is the unique quotient of M mu prime, but that we also know that V lambda occurs with multiplicity 1 in, in M lambda and therefore also named M lambda by M lambda prime and from that it is the uniqueness, it is fairly clear that V lambda is isomorphic V mu. We will work it out, it is quite simple. But I have to prove the statement that I do have an irreducible quotient, a unique irreducible quotient. The point is that <coughs> let because the module we know the module m lambda is finitely generated, so it does admit a maximum sub module, Zorn's lemma, any finitely generated module will have will admit a maximal sub module, <coughs> proper maximal sub module by Zorn's lemma. So, since m lambda <coughs> is in fact a monogene UG module, it admits a maximal proper maximal sub module. What we want to prove is this thing is unique. In fact, every sub module, proper sub module of M lambda is contained in the sum of weight spaces corresponding to eigenvalues of the form lambda minus sigma m alpha alpha. with m alpha <coughs> greater than or equal to 0 for every alpha and pi and at least 1 m alpha is not 0. The point is you take any, any sub module the, the whole <coughs> whole space is, bro is broken into eigenspaces for the torus t 
and therefore any subbody will also automatically break up into eigenspaces for T. Okay. And what are the eigenspaces? Eigenspaces, all the eigenspaces look like this. If I have a proper submodule, it will not contain mu lambda. It will not contain this. This. If I have a proper subnodule, <coughs> if it contains the vector v, what they call, it, if it contains the vector v lambda, it will be the whole module. What will generate by that will be the whole module. If the submodule contains v lambda, it should be the whole whole thing. But I want a proper submodule, so it cannot contain v lambda, which means it contains it will be contained in that sum, which which is a proper subspace. So any uh, UG submodule is contained in the vectors of space sigma some weight space corresponding to mu mu not equal to lambda. So it's every submodule is contained in some subspace like this, in a fixed subspace. So take these sum of all those modules that will obviously be a maximal submodule, and that will either be contained in this proper subspace. So it's a proper submodule. So there's a unique proper submodule. So M lambda has the so let's call this vector subspace E. E is not equal to <coughs> m lambda. So any any submodules contain any proper submodules contained in E, sum of all proper submodules is contained in E and hence is a proper submodule. The proper, it's naturally maximal because it contains every other submodule. So that's how you get all irreducible, all irreducible modules, provided there is an eigenvector for b. If if it admits an eigenvector for b. That V lambda is an eigenvector for B, which is H the torus plus T C plus N plus. If you have if you have something uh, uh, Burma module is essentially a module which has this property, it has eigenvector like this, and it's kind of universal for if ha, for having such an eigenvector. Okay, if V lambda is also more to V mu unit. Uniqueness is very special to this non-commutative situation, it doesn't happen in commutative algebra. I mean, singly generated module as a unique quotient is quite special. Yeah, yeah, it's a, it's a very special feature for of the Verma module. Yes. The fact that there's, there's an eigenvector of a B for the Burrell is the crucial thing. Yeah, and I think it's being semi simple for H module. For any sub module of M lambda, is semi simple for H, maybe it's playing a role. Yeah, because it's a sum of eigenspaces. Yes, sum of eigenspaces. Right. Any submodule is also sum of eigenspaces. Yeah, I mean that's what we're using. Yes. Any submodule is a sum of eigenspaces because it's stable and rich. The whole vector space breaks up into eigenspaces for H. So. <coughs> No, it has many well, it has many no, it, I mean, you cannot quite formulate anything in the competitive case. I mean, the Verma module is a very special kind of module which can be formed, whose very definition depends on the structure of the Lie algebra. There are probably generalization to quantum groups. Yeah, 
anyway all right so that proves the uniqueness of this module v now we have seen that the condition lambda alpha by alpha alpha greater than 0 for every alpha in phi simple root alpha is necessary for this unique quotient v lambda to be finite dimensional. If it is finite dimensional we have seen that it is necessary basically because you had finite dimensional representation of SL2 that is the kind of thing. <coughs> now well okay you see the point is that if you are now think you can prove the statement without using compact groups but we have compact groups available for us okay now the, the torus it's 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 not only a module over uh, ug it's a mod module over g and therefore there's a torus action also okay and you need the condition that it be if you want it if it's a what we'll see if the if if that condition 2 lambda alpha by alpha alpha is an integer is satisfied then it integrates into a character on the torus if 2 lambda alpha by alpha alpha is in z then lambda is the linear form given by a character so the, if everything is broken up into <coughs> eigen spaces for the torus itself well this is you know, the point is that uh, the infinite number representation the entire group doesn't is not clear the group operates in this infinite number representation but luckily the torus operates the torus operates because of this fact if in the on the infinite number representation if this happens then the torus operates that's what happens. okay hmm? torus see the point is you have the exponential map from t from t to t the exponential map okay now i want to say that uh, you have some element here x <coughs> operates on xv for any v for some weight vector xv equal to lambda xv say okay and then what i want is the following exponential of t x b will be equal to e power i lambda x if x is of the form i am taking x in the torus if x is of the form 2 h alpha by alpha alpha e power i lambda x <coughs> will factor through the torus it, see you must think of this exponential I am let me put it like I am thinking of uh, t as the Lie algebra t modulo a lattice t is after all circle cross circle cross circle and I have the real line I, IR, 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 so many copies that is the Lie algebra, and each factor is going to the exponential of that, that is the way it works. 
and if you want if you want this to make sense of the torus e per I, I, I want to say this is e per i lambda uh, tx v is what I want and when t is in the lattice this should become trivial because the lattice points go into 1 in the torus. So, it must become trivial and lattice, the lattice we are interested in is precisely the one which is done, generated by 2 h alpha by alpha alpha that is that is how it works. I have not said it very clearly, but think over it it is uh, <coughs> well and yeah. Um, well, in this case, we take G to be simply connected. Yeah, yeah, G, G to be simply connected. Yes, yeah, yeah. G, G has been so taken. Well, to, no, no hold on. That's uh, no. Well, I came here with a proof in mind. That seems to be wrong. So, <laughs> I think I'll stop here and prove this statement next time okay I, uh, finite dimension, finite dimension. So if if 2 lambda alpha by alpha alpha is integral then and greater than or equal to 0 then the corresponding representation is finite dimensional okay it's uh, well <laughs> but for the of the sl2 it looks finite dimensional but still for the no even for sl2 it's single sl2 it's not clear take take the Verma module for SL2. Yes, yes. And then it keeps, uh, it can keep going in the infinite direction. Yeah, the, you have to say it does not does not happen. Yes, yes. If, if 2 lambda alpha by alpha alpha is integral. Yes. I, no, I came here with, uh, with what I thought was a proof. Just now I find that my proof is wrong. <laughs> so, I will have to think a little bit and there is no point in my thinking here. It, it, I may not do it in finite time. So, <laughs> we will leave it at that. I will complete the proof next time. So, the su sufficiency of the integrality of 2 lambda alpha by alpha alpha, I have not <coughs> completed. The proof of that I have not completed. That is necessary, we have seen anyway. Okay. I think I will stop here. Thank you.